There we go. So we are now live. Hello, people. I see you, Kevin. In. Give us just a second. Let this room fill up a little bit, and then we will go ahead and get started. So go ahead and grab yourself a beverage or a blanket. Go get cozy, and we're going to get started just right now. So hello, everyone. Welcome to our little virtual event space. My name is Allie and I am your host for this evening. And I am so excited to be introducing Jonathan Taplin in conversation with William Derizowitz here to discuss Jonathan's new memoir, The Magic Years. So before we get into the fun stuff, I just want to quickly thank you all so, so much for tuning in. And of course, for buying books. Your support really is what keeps this place going and we really love what we do. So if you also love what we do, we would so appreciate it if you swing by and grab copies or if you're not local we do ship shipping is just 350 for the first book and a dollar for every book after that and i will be linking books in the chat all evening so they should be easy to find so we do have limited signed book plates available so if you'd like a signature in your book definitely come on in and grab your copy or give us a call or head on over to the website and buy that book so while you are over on the website, I definitely recommend checking out some of our other upcoming events or sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases, our online book clubs. And of course, you can follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. And I see your question. Um, third Place Books at Ravenna 2, I'm pretty sure it's just at our at the Lake Forest Park location. Um, though if you do leave a note in your uh, online order, we can make sure that that's taken care of. Um, so let's see. So we are here for about an hour and towards the end, we will be taking questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, which I very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, um, which should be either at the top or the bottom of your screen. Um, it is different than the chat box. The chat is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. But once it comes time for questions, definitely throw those in the Q&A so just so that we can most easily find them. So I believe that that is all of my housekeeping. So without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce Jonathan Taplin, the author of Move Fast and Break Things, How Facebook, Google, and Amazon Have Cornered Culture and Undermined Democracy, which was nominated by the Financial Times as one of the best business books of 2017. And of course, the book of the evening, The Magic Years. He's produced music and film for Bob Dylan and the band, George Harrison, Martin Scorsese, Wim, Wim Wenders, Gus Van Sant, and many others. He was the co-founder of Entertainer, the first streaming video on demand platform. His commentary has appeared all over the place, including in the New York Times, uh, Time Magazine, the Huffington Post, The Guardian, and many others. Uh, his memoir, The Magic Years, is both a rock memoir and a book of cultural criticism from someone who has been at the crest of every major cultural wave in the past half century and who watched the nation turn from idolism to nihilism. In conversation tonight, I'm so happy to welcome William Derizowitz. Uh, an, an award-winning essayist and criti critic and the New York Times best-selling author of Excellent Sheep, a Jane Austen education, and his most recent book, The Excellent, The Death of the Artist. He has received a National Book Critic Circle Award for Excellence in Reviewing, and his writing has appeared in The Atlantic, The New York mm -hmm. Times, Harper's, The Nation, and many other publications. So thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I am so excited to be a fly on the wall of this conversation conversation. If you need anything, of course, give me a shout. I will be invisible, but listening. Um, audience members, don't forget to throw your questions in the Q&A. And with that, welcome, both of you. Good to be here. Um, well, th thanks, Ali. Thanks uh, to everyone who's, who's uh, come. Hello, Seattle, from down the highway in Portland. Um, John, could you uh, start us off with uh, a reading? Yeah, I thought I'd just read this little passage from the beginning of the book, which situates me at the beginning of my life in the world of music. Strapped to a Fender 
Stratocaster electric guitar, Bob Dylan launched into the opening chords of Maggie's Farm almost before the band was ready. The Newport Folk Festival of 1965 was going to close with a commotion. I had just turned 18 and was an apprentice road manager for Dylan's manager. This explosive moment launched me on a lifelong journey, one beyond anything I could have imagined at the time. I was standing in the stage wing, transfixed, 10 feet from the band. Mike Bloomfield, acting like band leader, brought his Butterfield Blues Band rhythm section, drummer Sam Lay and bassist Jerome Arnold, into some approximation of sync with Dylan's rhythm. Al Cooper, in a loud polka dot shirt, hunched over the Hammond organ and did his best to fill in the spaces. But it wasn't starting well. I ran out towards the mixing board in front of the stage where Peter Yarrow had commandeered the board. It was worse out front. In his nervousness, Bloomfield kept raising his guitar volume and was now drowning out everything else. The first tune ended on a sour note and there was only light applause from the audience. I gazed behind me and a look of shock seemed to be the dominant emotion on the sea of blue work shirts and peasant blouses. The man in the tight pants, orange shirt and black leather jacket was not their Bob Dylan. What was going on? A force of booze filled the air before Bob started his radio hit like a Rolling Stone. But by the end, the fans were still booing. Voices from the crowd called for their favorite tunes from the folk era. The band looked nervous, but without a word to the audience, Bob plunged into, it takes a lot to laugh, it takes a train to cry. The band found their groove, but when the tune ended, the booing got worse. Dylan turned to Bloomfield and said, let's split. To the surprise of the other musicians and the road crew, he unplugged his fender and walked off the stage. Instantly, the crowd went silent. People started yelling at each other in the aisles. Look what you did. He's gone, asshole. Peter Yarrow bolted from the mixing council and I followed him backstage. Dylan was sitting on the bottom steps of the stairway leading up to the stage. He was clearly shaken, rubbing his eyes. Peter ran up onto the stage and seized the microphone. Hey, show Bobby that you love him. Let's get him back. The audience roared approval. Dylan sat on the steps. The audience began to clap in rhythm. Dylan refused to budge. Peter appeared at the top of the stairs, pleading with him to return. Johnny Cash wandered out of the artist's tent holding an acoustic guitar. For a minute, he watched the triangular drama of Peter, Bob, and the crowd. He moved over to Bob and handed him the guitar. Play them a song, son. Bob took the guitar and slowly walked up the 30 steps to the stage. When he appeared in a lone spotlight holding the acoustic guitar, the cheers from the audience were deafening. He leaned towards the microphone, raising his harmonica holder. Does anyone have a D harmonica? Out of the crowd, three of Honer's finest sailed through the air onto the stage. Dylan danced out of the way and grinning, picked up one and placed it in the holder. He started to strum the guitar. You must leave now, take what you need, you think will last. Whatever, what, whatever you wish to keep, you better grab it fast. Yonder stands your orphan with his gun, crying like a fire in the sun. Look out, the saints are coming through. It's all over now, baby blue. When he finished the song, he rushed through Mr. Tambourine Man and then turned and without a word, walked quickly off the stage. He had said his piece. They did not own him. And like a lover leaving a bad relationship breakup, he would not turn back. Wow. Um, you put us right in the middle of one of the iconic moments of the 60s, the hinge on which popular music turns, you know, from folk to folk rock or whatever you want to call it. I'm curious, what was your reaction to that moment? I mean, you were a folky. What did you think of it? Well, I had been a fan of, of Like a Rolling Stone. It had been on the radio for weeks. Uh, it had actually gotten onto the pop charts. 
And so I knew what Bob wanted to do, but the decision to, to play it live there at Newport was somewhat of an apostasy. I mean, I, I had gotten there because a friend, my brother knew one of Dylan's closest friends, Paul Clayton, and he got me a backstage pass and introduced me to a band called the Jim Questkin Jug Band. And they were managed by a guy named Albert Grossman. And Albert Grossman was Dylan's manager and Peter Paul Mary's manager and Odetta's and Paul Butterfield's. I mean, he really controlled the folk music business. So I went to work for Albert and on Saturday afternoon, uh, the Butterfield Blues Band played a workshop outside and a guy named Alan Lomax, who was the great folk music collector, blues collector, tried to unplug the amplifiers in the middle of the thing because he was trying to run a, a, a country blues workshop with Sun House and Skip James. And Albert kind of wrestled into the ground. And uh, so we went back to the artist tent and Muldar kind of regaled all the Dylan artists about how Albert had defended Butterfield and, you know, punched out Alan Lomax. And I saw Dylan just kind of grin. And I have a feeling that he just decided spontaneously that he would do the same thing, that he would go electric because it was not planned, I promised you. And so they threw together this band, which Bloomfield had played on like a Rolling Stone on the recording, but the, the rhythm section from Butterfield had never played anything but 12 bar blues. So they were to say the least lost in the way Dylan's music went. I mean, Maggie's Farm goes between two chords endlessly and then kind of magically turns into a third chord to resolve itself. And I watched Jerome Arnold, the bassist player, just fixated on Mike Bloomfield's chording hand, uh, trying to make sure he was in the right place. And did they have, did they rehearse at all? Hardly at all. They, oh, they supposedly went to some house out in the country Saturday night. Uh -huh. But my friend told me that they just smoked a lot of reefer and, and didn't really do much. And then I heard it for the first time during a sound check on Sunday afternoon. And I could tell it wasn't well rehearsed and Bob was not anxious to do a long rehearsal. And so the the people who ran the sound system at Newport had never really encountered electric music. So they were kind of lost. And so, I mean, from my point of view, on one level, I thought it was great. On another level, it, it could have been so much better if they'd rehearsed some. And of course, a month later, he got Robbie Robertson and Levon Helm to play with him at the Forest Hills Tennis Stadium. And then three weeks later, he got the whole group, Levon and the Hawks, to play with him at the Hollywood Bowl. And by that time, it was well rehearsed. But that doesn't mean people didn't stop booing. I mean, the Hawks yeah. got booed around the world for two years. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm wondering, like, how did you react to that? I would think, I mean, that the sort of the, I don't know if hatred is too strong a word, but the upset, the vitriol that was directed by the Newport Folk Festival audience at, you know, the hero of folk music. And I get, I'm take, guessing your hero. And I, I would think that that was really kind of upsetting. Well, it was. I mean, the, the folkies thought that rock and roll was sellout music, right? And so, they took it very seriously. And of course, many of them were already concerned that Bob had stopped writing protest songs and had, had said to a reporter, Nat Hendhoff, if you want to send a message, go to Western Union, you know? And so there was that. And then there was, you put rock and roll on top of it. And older folks like Pete Seeger were really irritated 
they thought they were preserving this folk culture in the face of commercial American culture. And commercialism meant rock and roll. And that was an unfortunate thing. You know, we're already getting into so many of the themes that you elaborate in the book. Um, but before we dive into that too much, I, I'm really, okay, so there's that scene in your book there. There are lots of scenes like this where you're at an amazing place at an amazing time. One of the details that really leaked out at me was that I guess you moved to LA in 71 and a friend gave you the name of a young film editor he knew because that young film editor was really into music too. And it turns out that the name of this young film editor was Martin Scorsese. And that was the beginning of your relationship with him. So um, look, I was born in 64. To grow up in the 70s, you know, was it, your life was defined by the fact that you had missed the 60s. That's what it meant to live in the 70s. You did not miss the 60s, okay? You missed the 60s less than anybody else. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, presumably there was an element of luck there, but I kind of have to feel like maybe it isn't just luck. And I'm wondering, you know, um, what would you say to a young person who wanted to live like an adventurous life? Well, of course, that's harder today, right? Isn't it? I mean, you and I, even, you know, you're, you're a generation behind me, but, but we didn't leave college $100,000 in debt. Um, you know, when I, I had friends who went to Berkeley, who were California natives, who went to Berkeley for a full year for $780 in, in the you know, late 60s. So I think what I would say is this, that yeah, there was a certain amount of luck involved in happening to meet George Harrison at the right time or, or you know, have being introduced to Marty before he'd made any really serious movies. But there's also a willingness to leave behind one gig that seems fairly secure and just take a leap of faith mm. that this next gig, which seems maybe more interesting or more exciting or more adventurous is worth doing, even though you're not really sure that you can make money at it. And so that becomes the kind of through line of everything that that I did was that I was never afraid to go through a big change. And some of those changes were really simple and some were very strange. I mean, I, in the eighties, I happened to find myself at Walt Disney making movies and a corporate raider named Saul Steinberg tried to take over Walt Disney. And I got some friends in Texas to essentially save the mouse. And so they paid me as their investment advisor. And I made more money in three weeks than I'd made in 10 years. And then they said, we want you to go to work for our real investment advisor. We want you to go to work for Merrill Lynch. And so I found myself without a business degree or anything in the Merrill Lynch mergers and acquisition group for four years. I mean, I, I couldn't handle it for more than four years. I missed uh, the creative life, but but still it was just like happenstance, chance. And that was like the, the great age of M&A, right? Of mergers yeah, and oh yeah, no, it was yeah. crazy. And yeah. you know, I made a lot of money, but it it, it wasn't that satisfying, quite frankly. But, um, you know, it's, I mean, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying again to sort of understand like how, how I mean, I, I totally take what you said about young people today and how much more constrained they are, but you know, sort of qualities of character, qualities of personality that quite frankly, I'm not sure I possess either to make the kind of, you know, you had six careers and you talked about, um, you talked about being, being willing to leave a sure thing for something that wasn't sure. And that led you to this and that and the next thing. But I also wonder, I mean, one of the, you know, one of the things you left was this uh, remarkable world of music, uh, full of passion and artistry and joy and right. pleasure. 
that you know that everybody was envious of. So, but you were able to, I mean, also just psychologically, not in terms of is this a risk or not, but just the fact that you were able to let go. Yeah. I mean, what do you think of that? Well, I, I did this job for George Harrison. I, I produced the concert for Bangladesh in, in 1971. And I had met him in England when I took Dylan and the band to, to play the Isle of Wight Festival in 69. And we'd struck up a pretty good friendship. And so when Ravi Shankar asked him to do Bangladesh, he asked me to do the physical production of it. And I did that. And it was an extraordinary, wonderful experience. But it also had some scary parts in the sense that Eric Clapton, who was ostensibly the lead guitar player in the band that George had put together, was battling heroin addiction. So just getting him on stage to play was an incredible battle. Um, and so in the summer of or fall of 71, I, I kind of looked around and the band didn't really want to tour. Dylan didn't want to tour. George didn't want to go on the road. Eric was too sick to travel. I briefly flirted with, with being the tour manager for the Rolling Stones Exile on Main Street tour. But when I got to France, they sent me a ticket. I realized that Keith Richards was in the same condition that Eric Clapton was in. And I just, it was, life is too short. And so I, before I was even offered the gig, I turned it down. And so I thought, gee, the only touring band in, in 72 that was big was Alice Cooper. And I had no desire to go watch someone bite the head off a chicken every night. And, and so I just thought, well, let's see if I could do something different. And a friend said, I said, I'm gonna to go to LA. And the, uh, this friend, Jake Cox, he said, well, look up this kid, Marty Scorsese. He, he edited Woodstock and he's a huge band fan. And uh, you like him a lot. So I went out there and he came to visit me and, and he brought me a script called Season of the Witch, which then became Mean Streets. And I was so naive that I didn't realize you weren't supposed to put your own money into movies, right? right? Uh, no one had told me about OPM, which other means people's other money, people's yeah. money. Yeah. Uh, so I got a friend to put up 250 and I put up 250 and for $500,000, we made Mean Streets. And thank God, Marty made a great movie and we were able to sell it to Warner Brothers for a little bit of a profit and, and own a piece of it. And it still pays me every year, you know, almost 50 years later. So that's pretty good. But it was just naivete. It wasn't brilliance, you know. I mean, I, I guess maybe looking at Marty's student films and extrapolating that he would be a great director might have been some kind of perception on my part, but that's about it. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I, I, I don't think I can get you, maybe because, you know, you can't be, one, one can't be self-aware at that level, but there's, I, I got to believe that there's a kind of openness um, that I think you must have. And, and I think one of the things that I would say characterizes at least my understanding of the 60s was, was very much a sense of openness. You talk in the book, I mean, this is again, one of the through lines in the book about, you know, what happened to that moment of idealism and openness and freedom? Do you think it could have gone differently? Do you think it, yeah. somehow? Yeah. I mean, it's very hard for us to understand from this point of view, but 1968 was an extraordinary heartbreak for the idealism, you know. I mean, not only had I been involved in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and then marched with Dr. King twice. But I also was all through the spring of 1968, I was working for Bobby Kennedy's campaign when he had decided to be 
to oppose Lyndon Johnson because of the war. And to have both Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy killed within, you know, eight weeks of each other was just like, holy cow, you, you can't get involved in politics. All it'll do is break your heart. And so a lot of people, including me, just said, fuck it, I'm going to go off and be in the rock and roll circus and I'm going to enjoy myself. And, you know, Jackson Brown wrote a great song called The Pretender, which is all about that, you know, struggle for the legal tender, uh, you know, trying to find a girl that makes me smile. I mean, that that kind of thing, the sense that politics breaks your heart really did hurt my generation a lot. And that's why I think it didn't turn out well. Well, I mean, you, you asked me a really interesting thing. You, you sent me a note and you said, yeah. because I quote Peter Townsend in the book that rock and roll created a project that it was unable to finish. And I think that's an interesting challenge for someone like Pete Townsend, you know, because The Who was one of those bands uh, like won't get fooled again, right? I'm not going to, you know. And to me, the thought was that We're musicians, agents of historical change. Right. Was that possible? Right. Could it be that the Beatles, John Lennon, Revolution Number no. 9, The Rolling Stones, Street Fighting Man, Bob Dylan, The Times They Are Changing, were they, were they possibly going to be agents of historical change. I mean, political change. Right. And probably that's the project that never got finished, right? That's what you think he was talking about? Yeah, I think so. I think there was, a, there was an implicit challenge that Rock presented in the mid 60s of like, we're gonna push the envelope of this culture. And this comes back to something you and I have both wrestled with, which is, does culture lead politics? You know, and is culture uh, seminal to creating change? And I think it is, you know, I quote Peter Drucker, who has this famous saying, which every business consultant uses, which is, that culture eats strategy for breakfast every morning. Meaning that you, if you can have a great strategy as a company, but if your culture is screwed up, if people are fighting with each other or you, know, you, you put down women and they can't succeed, you're never gonna succeed. It doesn't matter what your strategy is. But I think culture also eats politics for lunch every day, you know, and that that if, if the culture is screwed up, it influences the political scene. And I'll just give you one example. The music of the early 60s that I talk about, whether it's the times they are a change in or we shall overcome or Dr. King's speech, I have a dream. It's all very aspirational. It's very hopeful it's very empowering things are changing you know blowing in the wind the answer it's coming and when i look at the culture of the united states post 9 11 i see something very different i see a a kind of sense of nihilism uh, i mean think of the television shows that have dominated the world since 9-11. So The Sopranos, Breaking Bad, Mad Men, Game of Thrones, Succession. Mm. What do they all have in common? They're all what we call anti-hero dramas. In other words, the protagonist is a horrible person. He's a meth dealer. He's a gangster who kills people. 
he's a soulless ad man who has no morals. You know, he chops people's head off. I mean, if you constantly believe that the world is corrupt and only the bad guys, I mean, succession is about people like Rupert Murdoch who right. managed to succeed and get to the top because they're more corrupt than the people that are around them. Well, if you believe that, then it's not a great stretch to decide that, well, maybe we need a person who understands that corruption hmm. in the year 2016 to be our president. That's right. Yes. Um, somebody who's just as bad as these guys to quote unquote, clean up the swamp. And that's, that's an extraordinarily cynical point of view, but it's not one that is out of the realm of possibility. And obviously it happened and it was a disaster. I think that's all very well said and well taken. Um, you know, it was actually Andrew Breitbart who said something very similar to what you said. He said famously that politics is downstream of culture. And then in my book, I say, but culture is downstream of the market. And maybe we'll get into that. Right, but we should. We should get into that. But bef <clears throat> before we do, if, if I may, I mean, again, part, partly because I was a child of the 70s, for a long time, I had a complicated relationship with the 60s and was it really all what it was cracked up to be. And certainly one of the easiest things to pin on the 60s is that its political hopes ended not just in failure, but in catastrophe. I mean, it ended in Nixon and then in Reagan. But the truth is, I mean, I think, and I think you laid this out. I don't think that there's a direct line from say protest music or rock music to political change. I think art changes politics by changing culture first. Right. And certainly there are all kinds of screwed up things about our culture in the last 20, 40, 50 years, 40 years. But I mean, the whole spirit that the 60s unleashed, I think have, have been playing, them, playing itself out in the, not in the, first of all, in the rights revolutions that you know the civil rights movement but then you know after sort of rock it was feminism and gay rights but also i think just our whole attitude about our personal lives our personal freedom i mean that all kind of comes out of the 60s and i think it's almost the matrix in which our culture operates now well i would dif i would disagree a little bit okay in the following way is that i think it's very easy to mistake a kind of libertarian stance for what was really going on in the 60s. Because the 60s were not necessarily a libertarian time. In other words, Ayn Rand was considered a crackpot in the 60s. Um, you know, even Milton Friedman was completely not accepted in the 60s. It wasn't until the 80s that he began to be an important economist. So I would say that the 60s were more a communal world. In other words, a lot of the organization of not just politics, but, but life was communal. I mean, uh, literally communal. I would visit in Santa Fe, these communes that these, the hog farm had put up and all this stuff after Woodstock. And, and quite frankly, even Woodstock itself was extraordinarily communal. When, when we, the band was supposed to play at Woodstock. So Saturday morning, the New York Times, I pick up the New York Times in my local bakery in Barrisville. And the front page is like, this is a total disaster area. There's no food, there's no sanitation, it's raining, it's crazy and people are on acid trips, this is chaos. And so I called Michael Lang who was the producer and I said, what's going on? We're supposed to come down tomorrow. And, and, the, and he said, no man, it's groovy. <laughs> he said, the hog farm is feeding everybody. We've got all these doctors and nurses who put up tents to help people down off their bad acid trips and, there's plenty of porta potties and it's all going to be okay. 
He says, there's only one problem. You can't get here by car from Woodstock. So the Woodstock festival was not in Woodstock. It was right. like a hundred miles South. And so he said, I'm sending a helicopter to your house, <laughs> to your backyard. And so we got in this helicopter and we fly, we come over that ridge and see 350,000 wow. people in a field below. I swear to God, it was like a Cecil B. DeMille movie. It was like so striking. It was so epic and it was amazing, you know? And it turned out to be kind of gentle and nice and completely non-commercial. You know, nobody made any money anywhere. Nobody made money selling Coca-Cola to people and nobody made money selling tickets or t-shirts or anything. It was completely off the grid. So what do you think happened to that? I mean, I, I'm totally persuaded that the assassinations of 68 and maybe Chicago and Nixon, yeah. did, you know, kind of killed that political idealism. But what happened to the communal spirit? It got sold out. Woodstock Nation became the successor to the Pepsi generation. In other words, the whole hippie ethos was then used to sell products. And, you know, capitalism is very good at taking a kind of virus and changing it, taking it over and making it itself. So, I mean, what seemed like protest by 1971, you know, Coca-Cola was being advertised by hippies and, you know, it was the love drink. Uh, you know, and, and Volkswagen was celebrating that people were painting on the side of those, those ugly Volkswagen buses and making them into hippie vans. That was part of the sales pitch. You know? I mean, so I, I don't know. I think it just got co-opted. Um, which leads me to a question that, that your book raised for me, especially because you worked in the music business in one aspect or more than one of the music business and the movie business. Um, is the culture industry evil or is it a necessary evil? I mean, how do you operate in that environment? Well, you know, there's art and then there's commerce. Yeah. And you and I have both in our books tried to wrestle with that differentiation. And if I look, for instance, at the films that were up for the Academy Awards this year, I would say that both Nomadland and Judas and the Black Messiah are pretty artistic films and they're pretty brave films and fairly decent critiques of the American condition, right? And somehow they manage to surface in the American system. But then there's commerce. And you know, Marty Scorsese got a lot of flack this year for saying that Marvel movies are like theme park rides. Right. Right. But that's what they are. They're right. entertainments and they're, they're commercial entertainments which are meant to take you on a reasonably predictable ride with enough kind of changes that surprise you that you will be thrilled for an hour and a half. And the fact that someone tries to pretend that those are art is why, why bother? It's, it's right. obvious. It's just meant to be a commercial entertainment and accept it for what it is. So, I mean, I don't think there's anything inherently evil in the business. I think the business has these two tracks. It does happen that the commerce track gets most of the money. Right. So the people who are trying to make interesting indie rock music, whether it's in Seattle or it's in Memphis or Nashville, have a hard time making a living, especially in the age of streaming and you know the fact that what used to be able to be able to make a decent living on 
the sale of 5,000 albums like Bob Dylan's first record, you couldn't survive on that today. And so now musicians can only seem to make a living by live concerts. And then when you have a pandemic come, then that gets killed. It's really horrible. Right. But you know, I mean, maybe just to, I don't know if I'm pushing back or not, but before I, I started writing my book, I very much felt that art and commerce were antithetical and commerce was always the enemy of art. But as soon as I started to think about it and started to interview people, and I think your story shows this too, it's not that art and commerce are antithetical. I think that art and commerce need to maintain a healthy tension because the truth is you got mean streets made, you know, through the Hollywood system. I mean, you right. put it together, you know, so like I said, I think maybe it's more of a necessary evil than an evil. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, yeah, go ahead. I, I think that's right. And, and I think, you know, occasionally you have stuff that's both. So, I mean, if you think about it, in 1967, Sergeant Pepper, Lonely Hearts Club Band comes out from the Beatles. And that year it was both the most popular album, but it was also the greatest album. Right. Um, a few years later, The Godfather comes out. It was both the most popular movie and the best movie. Now, that doesn't really happen anymore. The most popular movie is, you know, some Marvel thing and the best movie is some little thing like Nomadland that maybe you know a hundred thousand people have seen if you're lucky you know what I'm saying so absolutely somewhere along the line we got separated where the best stuff once was the most popular stuff also that doesn't happen anymore but I wonder if that if we've um we've made the mistake of thinking that those few years uh, were the norm, because I don't really think that was the norm before that either. You're right. And I wonder, I mean, maybe this is a question that can't be answered, but like, how, how, did, that, how did that strange thing happen? What was the confluence that enabled art and commerce <clears throat> to magically align? I think it had to do with the fact that the business that had existed before, let's just say in Hollywood, was completely collapsing. So 20th Century Fox had made this movie called Cleopatra and it cost $27 million, which in today's thing would be $250 million, right? And it was just a little company. It was not a part of a conglomerate. Uh -huh. And they literally ran out of money and they had to sell off their whole back lot, what is now called Century City, to a real estate developer in order to make the payroll. Oh, when I sold Mean Streets to Warner Brothers, they were so on their butt that the only movie they had was Woodstock, which they had picked up for like a million dollars. I mean, they had no money. So somehow, because the old system was dying, the younger generation of George Lucas's, the Marty Scorsese's, the Spielberg's were able to get inside the tent and actually make stuff. And in the same way that happened, you know, quite frankly, in the early 60s with the folk music business, because what was popular in 61 and 62 was Frankie Avalon and Fabian. Most of the people on this Zoom have probably not even heard of these two people. And yet they were the top of the charts in 1961. And yet underneath that was Bob Dylan and Joan Baez and you know, Dave Van Ronk and a few folkies making authentic music with a, a guitar and a voice, um, playing in little clubs and their cultural influence was far greater than Frankie Avalon and, and Fabian. Uh, that, that faded into nothingness. And these 
So and it could be that, you know, when I go down to Nashville in September for the Americana Fest, I will see lots of young bands, the Milk Carton Kids or YOLO or Brandy Carla or Rhiannon Giddens, who are just making what I would call new folk music. Some of them are black, some of them are white, some of them are Latino, and it's all really interesting. Uh, and so maybe we're experiencing another one of those kind of cultural renaissances. Maybe. Um, it's interesting to me because you also reminded me of what people have said about why television was so great. I think that era is already passed. I think we're now in this kind of assembly line production of prestige TV. But I remember Mark Marin has said this, other people have said this, that certainly 10 years ago when lots of interesting stuff was being made, it's because the suits really had no idea what, what should be, you know, so they just let everybody do everything. You know, right. Louis C.K. got to make his show and so on and so forth. But now we're, you're talking about music and you're talking about today and we're really back to your last book and my most recent book. And the question is, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure there's all this great music that you're in touch with much more than I am, but can these people, how are these people gonna survive in the age of streaming? Well, you know, I, I think there's a few finite things we could do for musicians. One of which would be um, to remove the safe harbor protection for YouTube and Facebook and, and Twitter. So just so everybody knows what I'm talking about, um, YouTube can take any piece of music uh, that exists and any user can put it up and I can file a takedown notice for that specific piece of music and YouTube will probably comply within a week or so and take it down. And the next day it will be back up from a different user. I can never the tell you just for that link. Right. It's not even for the music. It's just for that link. Right. Right. So I can never say to YouTube, you cannot put my music up because I want it to only go on Apple music and Spotify's premium service where I could get paid a decent amount of money. And so Nobody will go, needs to go to Spotify if they can get it for free on YouTube. So th that's a big problem. That needs to stop. If you could do that, and then you could say, okay, new records only show up on the premium tiers of the streaming services where artists get paid a decent wage, then I would think more people would go onto the premium, would be willing to pay 10 bucks a month to get Spotify premium. And then, then there would be more money for artists. I mean, I, I don't know any other way to do it except start making little steps um, I agree. to do that. I agree. Yeah. Um, should we, uh, I see it's, it's almost 10 of, should we, uh... Yeah, I mean, are there any the questions? Audience? Yeah, There are some questions. Okay. I just couldn't bear to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> so our first question is from an anonymous attendee who says, um, oh, wait, wait, I lied. It's from, I'm so sorry, I'm bound to butcher names today. <laughs> but Parama says, uh, delighted to make this connection. Did you have a sense for how great the band would become when you saw them during the big pink days before the record? Are there any stories about them that you didn't, that you don't hear repeated that you'd like to share, especially involving Garth Hudson? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, look, the, the great thing about the band was that they were constantly evolving and learning. And Garth was a big part of that because the great thing about Garth was that he could play any instrument in the world. And so he, I mean, Big Pink, the, the, what is now known as the basement tapes, which were the, the tapes that Bob Dylan and the band made in this ugly pink house in Saugerties, New York, were, uh, 
created by Garth in the sense that he built a little studio with four inputs on top of his organ and a two track studio recorder. And the whole idea was let's record these tunes so Bob's publisher can get them out to other artists to do because Bob's not on the road and Bob's not making records and it lists a way for Bob to make some money. And so that was the idea. But what came out of it was that Bob began to teach the band about this kind of weird American music that he had was so deep into. And so that learning process of which Garth was a big part of uh, was extraordinary. And, and that was a very special time uh, that I think out of that came Robbie's ability to be a great American songwriter. I think he learned from Bob. That's awesome. So Brian, we're switching gears a little bit, uh, but Brian would like to would like to know. Um, he starts by saying you were also at the beginning of internet culture in the late '90s. It also seemed like a project that was never finished. Do you think big tech had a part to play in the post 9-11 nihilism? Yeah, I do. I, I had a friend say to me the other day, you know, if Facebook was around in 1955, we'd still have polio. <laughs> And I think that's probably true in the sense, if you think we're the source of most of the anti-vaccine propaganda is coming from, it's coming from Facebook. It's not coming from idiots like Tucker Carlson because Tucker Carlson has a relatively small audience. If he's lucky, he gets 2 million people a night. Facebook talks to 280 billion people a night. And so the problem with social media is that it has no boundaries. And so if you've created this anarchic disinformation system, uh, not only does it screw up the lives of artists, as I explained about YouTube, but it screws up the lives of our politics, of our whole ability to, to navigate in the world. When, when Move Fast and Break Things came out. The subtitle of that book is how Facebook, Google, and Amazon cornered culture and undermined democracy. And the English publisher, when it first came out, said, well, we think our lawyers think you should take out this undermined democracy thing, right? And so just as I was battling with them, this whole Cambridge Analytica thing came out in The Guardian in London, and so I didn't have to battle it anymore, and and it was obvious. But but the very fact that people would dispute the idea that these social media services were dangerous for democracy is absurd, and and so in that sense, I think I worry about social media almost more than anything. I think it's it's a net negative to society unless. You know, I mean, obviously anybody who's been on the internet for the last two months sees Facebook spending millions of dollars of advertising saying how much they want to change the rules of the internet, but they want to change them the way they want them. And so um, this is the same old regulatory capture. What makes me optimistic is that Biden has hired two people who are colleagues of both Bill and myself. I mean, I think, Bill, you knew them. I mean, so Lena Kahn, who wrote the book in terms of the great white paper on Amazon's monopsony. And uh, so it, it seems to me that there's going to be a new sheriff in town and exactly what form that regulation takes will be interesting. Um, and I, I don't know, but I think there will be, unlike both Clinton 
and Obama, there will be some attempt to put some controls around the big tech companies. So we have a few more minutes here. So if anyone else has questions, go ahead and throw them in. Now is the time, um, but we still have a few more. So Raymond would like to know, um, Jonathan, what is your opinion about authors like Bob Dylan, David Crosby, Stevie Nicks, et cetera, selling their publishing for a whole lot of cash to private companies and losing control? Well, look, if, if you're 80 years old, you're beginning to think about your heirs and your estate. I, I, I don't mean to be, you know, sad about all this, but, but publishing pays out over 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And if you're Bob Dylan, you're saying, okay, if I can get discounted the value of what my catalog is gonna pay over the next 50 years, and I can get it now and hand it to my children, I'm gonna do that. I don't see why not. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, like it's, it's not a public good, so to speak. It's, it's something he owns and he should be able to do whatever he wants to do with it. So an anonymous attendee would like to uh, says, interesting to hear you say that YouTube cannibalizes so much artist revenue. Uh, Google claims that they fingerprint enough of the popular stuff and does aggressive takedowns that you cannot upload stuff known to belong to others. Um, do you think that if that problem is fully solved, the streaming revenue payouts amount to uh, to much enough? So, Google does have a very good audio fingerprinting system, very similar to, you know, what you've seen that Apple uses and everything else. So that literally within two seconds, it can identify any tune. So here's what needs to be done. Google needs to put that on the upload side of their platform, not the download side. In other words, when, when a user tries to upload a tune or a piece of video or something else to the platform that the user who owns that piece does not want on the platform, then Google should block that. But of course, Google refuses to do that. I mean, and it's not like they don't do it with other things. You notice there's no pornography on Google. Why is that? Because they spend over $50 million a year on artificial intelligence to see every piece of porn that's uploaded on the upload side. So before it ever gets on the platform, it's blocked. Uh, so, and that's not humans seeing the porn, it's machines seeing it. And so they could do this very easily. It's just, they don't want to do it. It's not in their business model. So Brian says, and I love this question, and it's kind of perfect for, you know, our close to last one. So your life is so much more interesting than Cameron Crowe's. If they made a movie of your life, who would be all the almost famous actor playing you? <laughs> <laughs> I have never considered that. You know? but, but, um, I'll think about it and get back to you at another time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of putting you on the spot. <laughs> yes, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> um someone in the comments says Jeff Bridges. <laughs> well, okay, but he's a little long in the tooth. To play me. <laughs> he's a little old to play me at at uh 21. <laughs> I want to know who's gonna play me at 21. <laughs> Start pitching it. I'll watch that movie. Hey, thanks, Sally. This has been really great. Thank you. Thank you both so, and so much Bill. for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Your questions were <laughs> fabulous. Yeah. I really enjoyed being part of this. Great. So my, my last question is always, what is next on the horizon? What should we be looking forward to from both of you? Bill, you go first. Um, 
I was so absorbed in writing The Death of the Artist for four years that I had to put my um, freelance writing career on hold and I've been getting back into that. I actually have a piece on what the pandemic has done to artists and the arts economy coming out at Harper's in the June issue, which means probably a week from now. Great. I can't wait to read that. <laughs> um, my next, uh, I'm actually gonna try and do an in-person college tour in September for the book. So, you know, I, I actually believe that the, the world is gonna come back and people are gonna be able to gather in person in late September or early October. And uh, I, a lot of colleges want me to come. And so I'm going to, I'm going to do that. That's great. <laughs> That'll be fun. That'll be fun. Everyone keep an eye out. Okay. <laughs> All right. And, and, and if you're at a college and you want me to come, just let me know. <laughs> 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 so thank you everyone I think this is where we say good evening I see you all in the chat I love it um let's see Janet says what a treat absolutely appreciate the both of you insights observations and personality too if I may say <laughs> so thank you all so very much for being here this was such a great conversation as always everyone come into the bookstore or follow those links go buy some books we would love to see you tweet us let us know what you thought of this event and i think at this point all i have left to say is let the awkward waving commence <laughs> Bye. Bye -bye, and support independent bookstores <laughs> yeah that too <laughs> always good night everyone bye <laughs>